Um, so what I want to do is um, elaborate a little bit on uh, something David mentioned this morning, uh, or ju just a session before, uh, on how Kanban supports, or Kanban is a method for uh, managing knowledge work, uh, especially creative knowledge work. So given the breadth of scope of, of knowledge work, uh, that is a very uh, strong statement to make. And so I want to elaborate and explore, uh, explore that a little bit. So in terms of the breadth of uh, knowledge work, um, my, from my own experience, this is about people that are optimizing processes, that's knowledge work, people working in software, that's knowledge work, but also people that are working on a, on a digital platform, doing transformation, doing innovation, also that is, uh, that is knowledge work. So what I'm talking about is this really broad interpretation of knowledge work and how Kanban uh, is a method of managing that, uh, that knowledge work. So um, my version of uh, why Kanban. Um, so why Kanban is uh, important um, in, that, in that area uh, for me is that Kanban is a way of dealing with, uh, with reality. Yeah. So if you look at the ideal world, the ideal world work flows without any type of friction. And so we can, we can imagine that ideal world, we can ponder upon it. Uh, teams that are multifunctional, that are cohesive, and that there's little, little coupling between or dependencies be with other teams, all those nice things, we can ponder, ponder upon them and we can, we can dream about them. Yeah? But then um, there, is, there is reality, there is this messy reality where all these frictions uh, are present. Yeah? We have silos, we have specialist workers, uh, we have low communication bandwidth, um, and then most of all, um, we have the friction that is called resistance to change that actually um, is a resistance to moving towards that uh, ideal world, right? And so for me, Kanban is uh, a way of uh, dealing with uh, that uh, real world. Uh, so Kanban allows us to deal with the present reality, uh, dealing with the friction, but on the, on the other hand, connecting with the, with the future in terms of moving towards a more, uh, more ideal state. So that's why I think Kanban is important in, uh, uh, in this area. Um, now, knowledge work. So knowledge work is more than, more than work alone, right? So knowledge work, most of the time, it does entail some, uh, some aspect of delivery, eh? delivering stuff. But it also entails some aspect of, uh, of discovery, finding out stuff. Yeah. And so, and especially if we move from this delivery towards this discovery area, uh, more things come into play than just work. Yeah. We need to uh, discover information, we need to discover, uh, we need evaluate options, we need to make decisions. And so, the big question uh, that, um, that I think is important is, how does this impact our, our conceptualization, how our understanding of what flow is? Eh? Is it just workflow? Eh? Um, or is that information discovery, for example, is that embedded in the workflow as we, as we teach in, in uh, Kanban trainings? Or is there a need, especially if we move much more towards discovery, is there a need for different flows to be managed? Eh? So how does this concept of flow fit into the broader context of, uh, of knowledge work? Yeah. Is there like some notion of knowledge that flows? Yeah. Um, and how, how can we support that with, uh, with different Kanban systems? Yeah. So that's what, what I want to explore. So I will talk uh, quite a little bit about uh, knowledge work and, and unpacking this notion of knowledge work and, and what knowledge work means and how discovery and delivery uh, needs to be seen in that context. Yeah. But uh, I will also, um, so I'm assuming that most of you are, are in the context, working in the context of knowledge work. So that understanding will help you. Um, but I'm all, I'll also be showing some Kanban boards that, that uh, help you to manage that work. And I hope that, that the practical part that you can take away from this is, is, are those Kanban boards. Okay, so first step uh, is to, uh, 
to get a better grip on this uh, notion of, uh, of knowledge work. So my definition, so the definition that I use for myself is uh, that knowledge work is about solving hard problems. Um, in many cases, problems that we have not solved before or problems in unfamiliar uh, situations. But the hardest problem of all is finding the problems that we need to solve. So the hardest problem uh, of all is uh, which problems are relevant, which problems do we need to solve. Um, now from that, uh, from that definition, uh, we can clearly make a distinction between discovery and delivery. Uh, so delivery is about exploiting the knowledge that you already have acquired. So it's about uh, solving problems in familiar situations, uh, exploiting knowledge to solve problems in familiar situations. So that's the delivery part. Discovery is about finding out which problems to solve, eh? exploring new knowledge, finding out which problems to solve, or solving problems that have not been solved before, right? So this clearly distinguishes discovery and delivery. Now in practice, discovery and delivery cannot be, cannot be separated, and that's much of the confusion uh, when we start talking about exploring, exploiting, discovering, delivering, much of the co confusion is from the fact that those two, uh, in practice, those two elements are very much uh, connected to each other, right? Um, so most of the time, any type of delivery that you do, uh, so many of you might be uh, in, in the process of delivering software, any type of delivery that you do, there is some aspect of discovery uh, that is in there. Uh, Every time you have some discovery, there is some aspect of, uh, of delivery that is in there, okay? So I want to like analyze that, that confusion a little bit, uh, uh, unpack it, and then uh, that, that analysis will help us to uh, better design Kanban systems that, uh, that address this balance between discovery and, uh, and delivery. Okay, so not all knowledge work is alike. So that's, that's, a, that's a first, uh, that's a good starting point. So who's familiar with S-curves, technology adoption curves, S-curves? Yeah, so typically knowledge work does follow some type of, uh, of S-curve. So if we start at um, the bottom left on our S-curves, uh, we have this area where we, where we are exploring new problems. Yeah, so we don't even know which problems that are relevant, so we're, we're exploring. Uh, so this is the, the, the area of uh, knowledge where, 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 we do, where we don't even have uh, a hip hypothesis. So this is a, the pre-hypothesis area, um, the area where we don't even know what we don't know. Uh, so the area of the unknowns, unknowns. As we continue with the explore, we start to find relevant problems. Uh, we start to find um, we start to form hypotheses about those relevant problems and about solutions to those problems. Yeah. Um, so this is the, the hypothesis stage uh, where we enter into the known unknowns, right? And then if we move further uh, up to uh, the S-curve into the area where we have acquired quite some knowledge uh, about we have validated our hypothesis, we have acquired uh, quite some knowledge about the problems that we are, uh, are solving. So we have a certain model for relevant problems and how to solve those uh, relevant problems. Uh, so this is the area of the known knowns uh, where we have good models uh, to, uh, to solve uh, known problems. Uh, and so you can take this notion of models very broadly. Uh, it's uh, business models, models about our customers, models about uh, technology, we have, and that does not, not, does not, do not necessarily need to be explicit models, they can be also be implicit models. So it doesn't stop there. Huh? Uh, through our journey of the S-curve, we have acquired quite some knowledge, and we've internalized that knowledge, um, up to the point that we might not even know anymore explicitly what type of knowledge that we, uh, we have. Huh? So there's a last, last area of knowledge work where um, we have implicit assumptions, we have blinders on uh, because we, have, we are so much 
um, committed to a certain set of uh, problems, to a certain, uh, in the case of a business, to a certain set of customers, to a certain uh, technology, that we have put on blinders, that we have hidden assumptions, and we're not explicitly anymore about what we know. Eh? So this is where we don't know what we know anymore. Okay. So what I'm going to do is go through each of these areas. I'm going to go through it from right to left, uh, starting from post hypothesis, because I'm assuming that is the area where most people are most familiar with. Eh? So typical projects, uh, typical uh, software development, traditional, maybe also agile, uh, typically starts from an assumption of post hypothesis, whether that assumption is true or not is, is another matter, uh, but start most of the time from, from that assumption. Uh, so I will go through it from post hypothesis in reverse order to uh, hypothesis to pre hypothesis. Uh, and then uh, each time explore the balance between discovery and delivery in there and how uh, Kamen systems can, uh, can support that. Right? So and that gives an overview of, uh, of how Kamen systems support knowledge work. Okay, so post hypothesis. So this is the area where you have a clear goal. Yeah, it's very visible on the slide. You have a very clear goal. You know where the value is. You know where the money is. Um, you might have different paths to achieve your, your goal. Um, but um, uh, that's not a problem because you have a model. You have a map yeah, to first explore which path to take. Yeah, um, and then uh, before you start actually executing. Yeah. So the mantra here is that discovery precedes delivery. Yeah? The why, the what and how can be known up front, and we can discover that before we actually start, uh, start delivering. Okay? So the mindset is the reductionist mindset that, uh, that David talked about this, uh, in his keynote. So it's the managerial approach. Yeah? We have a clear goal. Uh, we have what we assume to be a relevant and achievable goal. We have a set of means, and um, we have a model uh, to see how we can apply those means to achieve uh, our goal. Uh, so the why, the what, and the how can be, uh, can be known up front. Okay. Um, in terms of Kanban, the, the, the typical Kanban system that you would see there is a system where you have an upstream Kanban for discovery, and a downstream Kanban uh, for, uh, for delivery. Yeah. So the upstream Kanban uh, is there to select uh, ideas within the context of a given goal, right? And to prepare those ideas, to transform them, to select them, and uh, recombine them possibly into concepts, into specifications that can be then executed uh, by a delivery team. Who's had some experience with this type of setup, upstream Kanban, uh, downstream Kanban. Uh, you can look up at it as a, as a kind of a, a structured uh, backlog, right? Structured backlog. Um, so because this is a, a selection process, so we move from ideas that we select into concepts into, uh, into, uh, into specifications, because this is a, is a selection process, um, there's this notion of minimum uh, limits. Eh? We want to have minimal options eh, because we want to ensure that the next step has enough, uh, enough options to choose from so that in the end our downstream team uh, has enough, enough options to choose from and that it doesn't uh, start from, uh, start from uh, uh, not having uh, specifications to work on. Right? So, while this is a Kanban system, eh, it's a Kanban system that is driven not by work, but by options, eh, uh, options to choose from, and it's driven by, uh, the flow is driven not by maximum uh, work in progress limits, but by minimum uh, limits of, uh, of options. Eh. So this is the first type of Kanban system uh, that, and, and what this, uh, the upstream Kanban system emphasizes is this notion of options, eh, and the, the value of options in, uh, in knowledge work, and this notion of selection and gradually going into commitment, and the notion of, to, uh, of the value of having sufficient options uh, to choose from. 
Okay, so I'm assuming that this is the type of uh, uh, knowledge work that most of you have, have been, uh, are familiar with. Uh, so the next step is to move uh, back, uh, back into the S-curve to move towards the, the hypothesis phase. So the hypothesis phase uh, or area is that area where you have some, uh, some goal in, some goal in that the goal is somehow clear, eh? uh, but there's multiple plots and uh, you, don't, you don't know which part to choose from. If you have a model, uh, like the man with the map there, if you have a model or a map, it's certainly not complete. Eh? So you know what you, want to, what you want to achieve, but you don't know how to achieve it. You don't know how to achieve it. So this is what uh, Dave Snowden calls the idealistic approach. So um, the idealistic approach is the approach where uh, you have an ideal, uh, a vision of the ideal future. You have the gap between that future and uh, where you are uh, today, and you find the way to close that, uh, to close that gap. Um, the uh, the approach here is the, the approach of the scientific method. Eh? It's the approach of forming a hypothesis of how you can uh, achieve that next step or how you can close that gap. Uh, with the ideal uh, future. Um, you form a hypothesis, you uh, devise experiments to validate that hypothesis, um, you, ex you, um, you execute those experiments, and then you learn from that. Eh? So it's, uh, it's really a, uh, a learning loop. Eh? This is the, the Plan de Chicac loop. Eh? So we're very familiar with this, uh, with this loop in the context of, uh, of process improvement. Um, the obvious camera system that uh, you would find, uh, the, the type of hypothesis that we are talking about, uh, the example on the slide is a hypothesis about building a certain feature and building a certain feature in terms of achieving a certain uh, outcome. So that's the example on the slide, but it might as well be a hypothesis about implementing a certain technology resulting in some type of uh, performance or security improvement. Uh, or it might be implementing a certain practice in your team leading to a certain uh, uh, increased capability or a, an improved fitness for, for, for purpose of, uh, of your team. Yeah. So it, it can be on, on uh, all different kinds of, uh, of levels. The typical Kanban system uh, that you would see there uh, is a PDCA uh, Kanban system, a Plan Do Check Act Kanban system. Uh. What you would find here is uh, a, uh, a number of hypotheses uh, that, uh, yeah, so you're moving from the left to the right. Uh, the flow is moving from the left to the right on the Kaman board. So you have a number of hypotheses. You devise experiments, uh, so you plan. Uh, you execute those experiments, uh, you do them, and then you check, you validate, uh, the, the, you check the result of those experiments and you adjust in terms of adjusting your hypothesis or adjusting your, your model or your understanding of, uh, of the problem. Yeah. Um, what these Kaman systems um, uh, emphasize is the importance of um, making our feedback loops explicit, right? <laughs> so with Kaman, uh, what we do is we implement uh, feedback loops, uh, like the operations review meeting that David talked about, uh, like the daily stand-up. Um, what we're doing here is actually making those feedback loops uh, explicit, right? Um, so this would be the typical Kanban uh, system that you would find uh, to manage all your, uh, your, uh, your process improvements, right? Um, so it's about discovering your process. Yeah? So discovering how you can make your process much more fit for, uh, fit for purpose. Uh, it does not only apply in terms of uh, your process, it also applies on the products that you build. Yeah? The build measure learn, yeah? the lean startup uh, build measure learn loop is just a variation uh, on this theme. Yeah? You, uh, you hypothesize about a certain uh, product market fit, you build an MVP, you measure the result, and you adjust, right? Okay, so that's a, an, um, 
a hypothesis on uh, a variation uh, on the team. Who's had some experience with PDCA, Kanban boards, or build, measure, learn, or has some kind of validation column additional to, uh, yeah, so, okay. So again, there's, uh, th this is starting to, uh, to emerge. So moving to the pre-hypothesis phase. So the phase where, or the area, where we don't even know what our goal is. Yeah. So we have a set of means. Yeah. Uh, the guy with the rucksack has, uh, he might have skis in his rucksack, he might have uh, a parapente in his rucksack. So he has, has a set of means. Uh, and he might have some needs, right? Um, but the goal is unclear. Right? He doesn't know where the real value, uh, the real value is yet. <coughs> okay. So this is the uh, the area of entrepreneurship, right? The entrepreneurial approach. Right? Uh, we have a set of means. Right? Uh, we have people that we know. Uh, we have certain skills. Uh, we might have a certain IP, we have a set of, uh, or a certain technology, we have a set, we have a set, of, set of means. Uh, we might imagine a set of goals, right? but we don't know which goal is really the valuable uh, goal to, uh, to achieve. Right? So the approach here is an approach of um, uh, effectuation. Yeah? Effectuation meaning um, you focus on what you can do, right? not on what you should do. Um, you start looking at whom do I know, what can I do, yeah? uh, what skills do I have, and then you start just acting. Yeah? Um, effectuation uh, means that you start acting and um, the, goals will, uh, the goals and the constraints will emerge. Right? So uh, the goals and the network of people that you work with will concurrently uh, uh, converge and concurrently develop. Right? So uh, people you interact with uh, self-select into the process. Um, each action that you take, each commitment results hopefully in uh, new means, new resources, but also new constraints. Yeah? And the more uh, you, you, you commit to a, a certain set of actions, the more constraints that, uh, that will emerge the more uh, constraints that will constrain your future, uh, your future goals. Right? So this is, and we'll talk about in the next step, we'll talk about path dependence. Right? So this is, a, this is an example of, of, uh, of path, depend, path dependence. Okay? Uh, in terms of Kanban support, to the best of my knowledge, yeah, the type of Kanban I would expect there, uh, of, or that I've seen there, is just an and uh, a board that tracks actions, right? Typically, it looks like PDCA, but it's not PDCA, yeah? in the sense that it is not planning of experiments and validating those experiments. It's more like planning actions, executing those actions, checking whether those actions are, uh, uh, have been executed according to what you expected, and then, uh, then adjusting. Yeah? So it looks like PDCA, but it's not really PDCA. Okay. Um, now there's a last area, and this is the area of the hidden assumptions. So we've moved through our S-curve. We've acquired a lot of knowledge. We've, um, uh, we've internalized that knowledge up to the point that we have put on ourselves uh, a set of blinders. Eh? Constraints have merged. The network of people has converged. So we've put oursel our on, uh, ourselves on a set of blinders. Eh? Up to the point that um, we have a map, but we don't look at the map anymore. It's in our rucksack, right? Uh, we blindly go to our goal, meaning that uh, we don't see the invisible gorilla that might harm us, right? Uh, but we also don't see the ugly babies, eh? in this case, the ugly duckling, uh, that may turn into a, uh, a, to a beautiful swan. Eh? Because of those blinders, we, don't, we filter them out. Okay? So this is the notion of uh, path dependence. And so we've gone through uh, our early stage of pre-hypothesis. Um, 
we started with the means that we have and then constraints started to accrete, right? Uh, and the more constraints that, that uh, accrete, the, more, the less options that we have, the less managerial flexibility uh, that, uh, that we have. And in the pre-hypothesis phase, we actually use that in a very constructive way in terms of devising the goals that we want to achieve, devising which problems are relevant to, uh, to pursue. Yeah. But as we move towards hypothesis validation and towards more exploitation, yeah, um, these blinders really become, uh, become a hindrance. Yeah. So this is the notion of path dependence where uh, the set of decisions uh, that, uh, that we are uh, taking are limited by decisions that we have taken in the past even if the situation uh, has changed uh, where this, uh, that way of working is not, uh, is not relevant anymore. Yeah? So this is, uh, for many organizations, this is the danger zone. Yeah? Uh, they are in a danger zone, but they don't know it uh, themselves yet, yeah? or teams, right? Um, so this is the area of weak signals, uh, the area of ugly babies and, and invisible gorillas. So the invisible gorillas in terms of um, things we, uh, that are there. We might look it in the face, but we don't see it, right? Uh, things that might be uh, uh, kind of harmful. So that's one part of it. Um, the other part of it is, um, is the ugly babies, meaning that, um, so to, um, to quote Ed, uh, Ed Catmull, uh, every good idea, or, or to paraphrase him, uh, every good idea most of the time starts out as a very ugly idea. Yeah? In the context of Pixar, uh, every movie that we see in the, in the beginning is very, very ugly. Uh, it's, uh, the idea is, is not well formed. Um, and if we put our, up on our blinders too much, uh, we discard those ugly babies. Uh, but in the end, by discarding those ugly babies, uh, we also uh, discarding the beautiful movie that, that might uh, might come out of that. Eh? So uh, uh, ill-defined ideas need protection the most, lest they, def they die too young, right? Um, so the way of operating here is uh, sense and respond. Um, so yeah, there's two sources of, of, uh, uh, of inspiration there. One is uh, Boyd Suda loop, eh? observe, orient, decide, act a strategic decision loop. So the emphasis really on observation, uh, so much of an emphasis on, on being very open in your observation and then orienting yourself uh, before you, you, start, uh, you start acting. Or sense and respond in terms of uh, making sense of, of the world around you and then uh, responding to that. To that. So the typical Kanban board that uh, you would see there uh, would be an uh, OODA loop uh, Kanban board. Huh? A Kanban board where you explicitly um, solicit uh, observations uh, from the team or from your environment. Huh? So you explicitly um, 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 cater for observations. Um, you collect those observations, you take them into active observation, uh, you orient, as a team, you orient yourself uh, around your, these uh, observations. You make a decisions and then you, uh, you act accordingly. Yeah. So the typical items that may be, might be on this board, uh, it's a strategic decision loop. So the typical items that might be on the board are problems, risks, opportunities, uh, uh, potential opportunities uh, uh, that the team comes up with. Uh, and that you want to make a decision around. Yeah? So what is on the board here is actually observations or decisions to be made. Yeah? So you have this notion of, uh, of a decision, a strategic decision uh, cycle here. So what we're looking here is a board that uh, makes the decision process uh, explicit and also emphasizing, again, also emphasizing a good flow in your decisions. Yeah. There's nothing uh, as harmful to a team uh, if they come up with risks and nobody does something about it. Yeah. 
So a good flow of, of decisions here is, uh, is, really, uh, is really critical. Um, so each of these areas doesn't work in isolation. And there's, a certain, there's a certain flow to it. Um, so we started with uh, a trigger point, uh, triggering us into action, and then through those actions, constraints start to, uh, start to build up. Uh, up to the point that we could formulate a vision and hypothesis about the situation that we're in. Uh, and then we devise experiments to, uh, to validate those uh, hypotheses. Um, moving into uh, the point where we have a model uh, about the problems that we, uh, the relevant problems that we want to solve and how to solve them. So uh, this creates a certain set of options that we can uh, we can take, uh, we commit to those options uh, up to the point that if we have committed to quite a few of them, that we're in a situation that we're over committed, yeah, where there might be, uh, there might be uh, weak signals, uh, uh, ugly babies or uh, 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 invisible gorillas that we need to take into observation and then uh, uh, orient ourselves around it and uh, again, we're uh, up to the point where we can start uh, taking action and go through the circle again. Yeah. So if you take it all together, uh, this is kind of the discovery cycle. It's a, a complete picture of the discovery process um, in, uh, in action. Um, now, putting it, uh, so and we've, we've discussed a number of CAMA systems that uh, can be useful in each of these uh, in each of these steps. Now, obviously, in knowledge work, it doesn't flow that sequentially, yes, uh, as is here on the on the picture. Yeah, any type of complex knowledge work, yeah, uh, there's lots of things going on. We might have some discovery in one area. Yeah? We might be uh, in um, in the observation part in one area while we're in the delivery part in another area. So it typically doesn't, it isn't that nice. Eh? Discovery and delivery are not cleanly separated from each other. Yeah? Um, so it is not the case that you flow from CAMA system to CAMA system as, as is, on, eh? is uh, shown here. Eh? So a better mental picture to support uh, knowledge work would be a picture where you have a visualization. Eh? Uh, if you look at, sorry, if you look at the loop here, typically there's no uh, one starting point and no one ending point. You might enter into the into loop at, at different places. Yeah? So it's not that, uh, that clean. So a better way to think about it is to have a visualization of knowledge work in terms of having all those CAM on boards uh, present, having an upstream CAM on board, a downstream CAM on board, uh, UDA, PDCA, yeah? uh, as a way of of managing, uh, managing your, uh, your knowledge work, right? Um, so an example of that is a program management Kanban, uh, where on the one hand we have uh, an UDA, a Kanban for UDA, uh, where we explicitly solicits, solicit uh, issues, risks, opportunities within, uh, within the program uh, on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand we have a PDCA uh, Kanban where uh, we, uh, we track experiments uh, and actions that we are uh, taking. Yeah. In terms of balance, um, the visualization, uh, different colors help us to see how much uh, observations are in the area of observing risks, how much observations are in the area of uh, observing opportunity. Uh, so we can get some kind of balance where the team is. Uh, uh, also in terms of the actions, uh, how much uh, on our PDCA, how much actions are we taking that are not experiments, and how much action experiments are we doing. Uh, so that, that gives us some indication about um, is the team just taking action and not learning, or is the team actually uh, uh, learning. Uh. So that's one example. Uh, another example is uh, a product management Kanban when, where the top uh, part of the Kanban board is uh, a build, measure, learn, where we are, uh, where we are creating real options um, 
where we are creating, uh, validating MVPs and, and uh, uh, um, uh, learning yeah, from in terms of uh, what what is valuable, uh, what has value in our product development, and on the top left, uh, on the top uh, part, we have just an execution uh, command for uh, planning, building, verifying, uh, executing, verifying. Uh, things that we are committed to, to actually uh, deliver to our, uh, to our customers. Uh, again, we can see a balance between discovery, the top part of, uh, of the board here, and delivery, uh, the bottom part of the board. And visually, we can, we can look at that balance in terms of uh, are we exploring enough in our product development or, uh, or are, we, uh, uh, are, are we delivering enough in our product development? So with that, I, uh, I want to end. So showing a little bit what, uh, what type of CAMAN systems uh, can support knowledge work in a, in, a very, uh, in a very broad sense. So not just the delivery part, but also the discovery part in its different uh, manifestations uh, throughout the different, uh, the different types of knowledge work uh, throughout the S-curve uh, that we have. And I'm open to questions with that. In your experience, uh, do you have any companies use the kind of upstream camera tools? And most everywhere I've worked, it's very much focused on delivery. Uh -huh. and so once you're in the actual design, build, test, yeah. and implement. But I've never really seen it used for discovery. And also feedback uh -huh. transformation. Yes. Um, I, I can't speak, I can only speak from my own experiences. Um, and so, I'm biased of course, <laughs> yeah, right? So in each, in each situation that I'm in, uh, I see a great value in terms of implementing an, uh, an upstream CAMMAN or a PDCA CAMMAN. Uh, in every situation, I see, I, I see a, a great value. Uh, well, I don't see um, value, yeah. Now, I've, if I look at um, I, some of the feedback of other, other people, and also if you look at uh, this, on a regular basis, there's people that are uh, making a blog post about, ah, uh, I've got this visualization of my backlog, right? And it's actually a, an, a, an upstream CAMMAN board, right? Um, maybe they're not very explicit about minimum uh, limits, eh? Uh, but at least it, it's a start of the visualization of the upstream part of your uh, uh, of your process. Okay. Um, you have been uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, I, the, the Horizon 1, Horizon 2, Horizon 3 doesn't map cleanly on, on what I'm saying here. Um, so, I'm not sure whether, yeah. Have you encountered a cost of stabilizing the Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure whether, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, yeah. And I think part of what you're trying to ask there, and I have experience of this, is um, if you work with a team and you're in that sort of, we're not sure, we've flushed out some assumptions perhaps, we've also been told this would be great, you're in all ends, you're actually doing all of those boards, but actually, you know, what's your experience trying to work with the team and you could have all of those boards, whereas we tend to just have a single board and then you determine, well, is it, is it good to take it from that stage to another stage and put it through that yeah. generic board? What, 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 you got any sort of observations yeah. on that? So, so the, the assumption that I'm making here is an assumption where it has a certain level of scale where you do need to visualize it to be able to manage it. 
right? There's enough people involved. And if you're talking about one team, um, a lot of a lot of a lot of what is happening here is just happening in the interaction between people. Yeah. I'm assuming here that you need to, it's, it's at a level of scale where you need to visualize it in order to be able to, to manage it. Yeah. Okay, good. I got the sign to stop, so. Uh, <laughs>